Welcome to Good Friday 2021, and welcome to a collaborative project involving four Summerland churches, five pastors, one worship team, and the Okanagan Tenors. Our theme is, How Could He? You're going to hear today from Pastors Lee Young and Del Reamer from Summerland Baptist, Pastor Guna Vadati from St. Stephen's Anglican, uh, Don Houston from Julia Street Community Church, and myself, Rick Gay, from Summerland Alliance Church. Brad Reamer has gathered a group of musicians to lead us in worship, and the Okanagan tenors are going to be singing. At the end of this service, we will be celebrating communion. So we encourage you to have your communion elements ready so you can take communion with us. Whatever you have in your home will work for communion. Thanks so much for watching and being a part of this. We're delighted to share this time with you as we contemplate the events surrounding Jesus' arrest and trial, his crucifixion, and death on the cross. Brad and, Brad and his team are now going to lead us in a couple of songs. I the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in Jesus paid it all, and all to him I Sin has left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thy alone can change a leper's heart. Have you 
you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh. All right, I'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 53, starting at verse 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offering 
and prolong the days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with their transgressions. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, good morning, and uh, welcome to our ministerial panel that we have as a part of our Good Friday service this morning. Um, you see these four gentlemen that are with me. This is, these are all pastors of the uh, four of our churches here in Summerland, and these are all the lead pastors, the main pastors of these churches, I have the dubious distinction of kind of moderating this panel, and I think it's appropriate that being the kind of the token old age pensioner of the group, that I also have the podium that is a little more spiritual than the others. So uh, those of you who are, are watching in these various uh, churches, uh, I hope you can find this engaging. And I hope that also you will grasp the unity that we have in terms of faith and our pursuit of truth through the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I find oftentimes Good Friday, the events that we consider, celebrate, however you would voice that, they, um, they obviously encapsulate a very complex series of events and a story which we often think of, well, there's great tragedy, there is intrigue, there is horrible grief, there's unthinkable love and deep significance to the entire human race. Now, it's easy for us to relegate all of the events that led up to and the events of what we call Good Friday and relegate them to, well, it's history, or it's just, it's the foundation of our, our faith. And it would be easy for us to miss the personal significance of what took place on that event some 2,000 years ago. So I hope that as we engage, that you will gain the significance and draw in to it as an individual and that you would perhaps draw some conclusions according to our discussion this morning. Now, these are, as I mentioned, the pastors of four of our churches who are going to share their personal perspective on four of the, the characters that are involved in the Good Friday story. I want you to know that what they're going to be sharing is not something we have rehearsed. We haven't talked about what their answers to my questions are going to be. Um, and they've been, they've been reminded, not, we're not planning on preaching four or five sermons here. <laughs> but this, th their conclusions are drawn from their own personal study of Scripture, their own experience, and their invitation that God's Holy Spirit would reveal to them the truth that He would like to settle in their hearts. And as a result, we hope that it'll also settle in yours. Now, you and I, we have probably deep questions about some of the things that took place and the characters that are involved and why they responded in ways that they did. The perspectives that you are going to hear probably are drawn in to our personal situations as we relate to these people, and I hope that that strikes a chord with you, and you can also find yourself in the story that we're going to be talking through. So from there, I think we should begin as we invite the Lord to guide our conversation. I'm going to start, first of all, and address probably one of the most controversial characters in the Good Friday story, and this is the one that uh, I'm going to engage Pastor Rick with. Judas Iscariot. Like, what's with that? And as you know, our kind of theme is, how could he? And so we're going to be asking that question. 
And I want to begin with Judas, who was one of Jesus' 12, 12 disciples who walked with Jesus. He observed all those miracles that he did. He, he followed his teaching. He sat under that teaching. We know that he was kind of the group's treasurer, that money and all of that was important to him, even though we also read that he had a little bit of a problem with that, and there were times when he kind of dipped into the the pot from time to time. But when we think about who he was to Jesus, we get a little bit of that from John chapter 13, 18, where Jesus says that uh, these events that were happening had to happen as a fulfillment of Scripture. So what Scripture is he referring to? Well, he actually quotes from Psalm 41, verse 9, which, which gives you a little bit of the relationship that he had with Judas. That passage says, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. So Rick, considering all the time that Judas spent with Jesus, uh, the relationship that he had with him, listened to him, supported, partnered with him, how could he turn against Jesus, the, the very one that invited him and even gave him life. How could he do what he did? So you ask the question, how could he? Well, let me ask a question. And to quote from a song that has no relation to me, how do you solve a problem like me? I am a problem in more ways than one. And I am the source of many a debate to this day. So how could I? Maybe I was the product of prophecy created to fulfill scripture. Maybe I was the product of a poor upbringing or simply born into the wrong family. After all, I am known as the son of perdition. It means I had the character of a destroyer, a murderer, or a traitor the progeny of abuse and desolation. And when you think about it, Jesus made it easy for me. I was chosen to be one of the 12. I participated in ministry. I was given power and authority over all demons. I had a healing ministry. I could cure diseases and I proclaimed the kingdom of God. And I had the responsibility of carrying the donation box. Who trusts a thief with the money? Do you remember someone named Flip Wilson? The one who is credited with the phrase, the devil made me do it? How could I? Hey, the devil harassed me constantly. He prompted me, then entered me. How could I? That's how. Then there was my confession. You can read about it in Matthew 27. When I learned that Jesus had been condemned to die, I was filled with remorse. I gave back the 30 pieces of silver, and then I declared, I've sinned, for I've betrayed an innocent man. Don't you think that counts for something? If this were a court of law, have I provided enough material to at least raise reasonable doubt? But then, what about the other side? The Bible teaches that no one is without excuse. All have been created with the ability to choose. It's called free will. And then here's a sobering thought. Active involvement in ministry is a good and wonderful thing, but it is not in itself a guarantee of spiritual life or health. Do you know that I never called Jesus Lord? I called him Rabbi, but I never called him Lord. And I never had a personal relationship with him. Oh, I did good things, but my heart was never genuinely engaged. Does it not remind you of something that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13? If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, 
I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. You see, I didn't love him. Oh, I did things, and I ministered, and I knew things, and I accomplished things, great things, miraculous things. But I didn't love him. I loved what I hoped I would get from him. Position, power, prestige. That's what I wanted from him, and he could have given it to me. To me, to us, to the nation. He could have restored Israel to its former glory and its place on the world stage. He could have grabbed it, he could have taken it, but he never did. And I got tired of waiting. I decided to do the only thing that I felt I could do, betray him and sell him out. Then I could have my place, make a name for myself, be the one that they all talked about. Well, I got my wish, but it all went horribly wrong. With my eyes, I saw the clearest evidence. With my ears, I heard the finest teaching. With my feet, I followed the greatest example. And yet, I still betrayed him. How? Though I witnessed it all, it never changed my heart. The evidence, you know, has to travel from the head to the heart. And the whole thing about the devil made me do it. Here's the truth. And that might sound funny coming from me. Satan can't approach a soul unless the soul has first turned to Satan. Don't give the devil a foothold, the Bible reminds us. You give the devil an inch, and he'll take it, and more, if you let him. So take this from me. Guard your heart. Don't walk away from what you know is right. Before you make a decision, fast forward the consequences, and never give up on Jesus. Trust him. He is the hope of the world. Hmm. Thank you, Rick. That is, uh, that's sobering. I think because we, we cannot, I think you listen to that and we cannot say, oh, that rotten guy. I think we have to take a look into our own heart and into our own soul. How many of us have regrets because we know that Judas had regret but we don't see a repentance. We don't see a turnaround. And uh, yeah, that speaks to my heart. Well, we're going to move to over and uh, address Don over here and ask him a question about probably the most well-known and prominent of Jesus' disciples. We, we read more written about Peter, Simon, who's Jesus changed his name to Peter uh, probably more than any of the other disciples, probably combined. And I want you to remember that Peter was called out of his career. He was, we call him a tradesman, if you, if you will. He was a, a fisherman. And in the midst of being a fisherman, he met Jesus, and Jesus did for him what Peter could not do. Peter couldn't catch fish that, that first night. And so Jesus didn't just help Peter do what Peter does. Jesus did what Peter could not do, regardless of all of his experience. And Jesus filled his nets with a miraculous catch, and as a result, it got Peter's attention. And then Jesus looked him in the eye and invited him to follow. Now, we see all through Scripture how Peter very much was a reactionary. Um, he tended to say or to voice what other people would think but maybe wouldn't say. I, I relate to Peter. Sometimes speak when it would have been better to be silent. And in fact, when told by Jesus to follow him no matter what came about, Peter just spoke and he looked over at John. He says, yeah, what about him? What about that guy? It's the reaction, and it's both what we kind of love about Peter, because we can relate, but we also see that great weakness. Peter also was, was one of those extremes. When Jesus said, get out of the boat and walk on the water, Peter accepted Jesus' invitation. He did exactly that. When, when Jesus asked 
who do you say that I am? He identified that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said that in one breath, but then in the next breath, he challenges Jesus' methods. He tries to defend Jesus as though Jesus needed his defense. He also ran a reactionary to defend Jesus, slices off the ear of one of Jesus' attackers. And he assures Jesus of his undying loyalty no matter what. So I want to ask you, Don, as you have considered this character, uh, and it's probably a good, a good name for Peter, he was a character, but considering his graphic transformation that we see over the course of even Jesus' ministry and his bold statement in Luke chapter 22, verse 33, where he says, I'll go to prison, I'll even go to death for you. I want to ask you, how could he? How is it possible that this man could betray his friend, his teacher, and his Lord? What do you think? When we look at uh, the story and the, the character of Peter, we see that he wasn't alone in his relationship with Jesus in the sense that when all the 12, they witnessed his healings, which Jesus gave them the power to do likewise in his name. Uh, they witnessed his deliverances, his command over the elements, his feeding of the crowds, his large catches of fish, his challenging of the religious leaders of his time. They listened, he was there, went and listened to numerous profound messages of the kingdom of God through the use of parables and sermonettes and Old Testament quotations. He witnessed the upside-down perspective of a right-side-up Lord and Savior on the law, on slaves, on women, on race. Peter didn't miss much. He was there through it all, and yet he, we arrive at this moment where he vows to follow at whatever cost. However, Jesus, his friend, his Lord, straightens Peter out by declaring that he will deny him three times. Jesus wasn't surprised or taken off guard by this. He predicted it. Which he does, and which he feels great shame and guilt, Peter does. So the question is, how could he? And I have five responses, but I'm only going to share on two. But the other three, his human nature. Isn't it within us sometimes to have pride and to look for status and to be part of the in crowd? Maybe his need for affirmation by Jesus and by man, easier to deny Christ and to face his peers. And we see some of that in, when he's dealing with the Gentiles and then the Jewish council and then he kind of pulls away from the Gentiles. We find that in Acts. And or maybe it's his unwillingness to fully, truly deny himself, as Jesus mentioned, that Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, this is in Matthew 16, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But there's two other areas, and I want to just briefly mention these. It's quite possible that he only heard part of the message. He was only listening part-time, part of the way. Matthew 20, 25, and 28, Jesus' focus was that the greatest must be a servant, that the first must be the last. It was modeled by Jesus himself. He said, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Note the interchanges that highlight this between Jesus and Peter uh, around uh, Jesus' teaching and that he must die and rise again. We see in Matthew 16, 21 and 28, Get behind me, Satan. This is when Jesus is saying, not you, Lord, not you. And, he, and Jesus says, I mean, this is a pretty big statement here. Get behind me, Satan, exclamation mark. You are a hindrance to me. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man, right? So he's, he's, only, he's only hearing half the message here. In Matthew 26, you will all fall away. This is Jesus speaking. You will all fall away because of me this night, this very night. Like, it's going to happen within a few hours. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Though they all fall away, this is Peter saying, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. <laughs> but even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Wow. And yet, notice this, and all the disciples said the same. Wow. So he's not as, you know, like they all declared, and yet all of them pulled back, and all of them ran away. 
But on the other side, he only received part of the message. There's a difference. He only heard part of the message, but there's this other side of it, which is he only received part of the message, the fullness of Jesus' message, and the plan was not fully revealed until the end. In Luke 24, it says, And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is at the end of his ministry. So there's this part that Peter, being human, he only heard half of what, because, you know, he had an agenda, or maybe he had one of his affirmation, one being the in crowd, whatever it might be. But then there's this other part of his experience, and that is that not the, the full understanding of what Christ was all about in his plan was not fully revealed until Jesus was ready to ascend into heaven. John 2.22 after he was raised, Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. In John 13, Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And then he goes on, he says, I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. And John 20, just before he decides to, before he ascends into heaven, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Even with all of this, even with this, whatever it might be that's going on with Peter, what I love about him is that he still stays in the game. Right? His true self died that night, preparing him to receive the fuller message, but he still hung out with the disciples when, when, the, when the women came running back and said, the, the tomb is empty. There's Peter right there with all the disciples, and, and he runs to the tomb with John, and, and then when Jesus appears to the disciples, Peter is right there, and then even at the end when he meets with the seven and they have breakfast together, and then Jesus calls them aside and, and has this moment with them, Jesus is there. Like he could have, he could have taken his shame and his guilt, and he could have, you know, isolated himself and ran away and just given up on this call that God had called on, put on his life to follow after Him. I mean, denying the Lord when you've proclaimed that you will never deny Him, and yet he still hung in there. And I love that Jesus is grace to Peter, Luke twenty-two, and he says, "Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I." Jesus says, I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So even in that moment of betrayal, of denial, Jesus still speaks to him and says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, but I. And then in John 21, he just says, Peter, do you love me? And three times. And Re reconnects Peter to his original call. Follow me. You've gone through all of this. You've gone through a trying time. You've denied me, but I'm looking at you with grace and with mercy, knowing what you fully deserve, but I'm saying no. Because of my death upon the cross, you, you are called, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you mightily for my kingdom. And Peter, heart, ready to receive the full message to hear and understand and to receive the full message of what God's plan was and to be used by God for God's glory. Anyways, that's my thoughts. You know, just thinking of that, aren't you, aren't you glad that God saw fit to include things like this, Peter's failure in Scripture for us? It, it reminds me of David as well, you know, who, who did horrible things and at the same time kept on coming back in repentance. And then we know him as a man after God's heart. And I, I see Peter very much that way as well. Well, we're going to move on to our, our uh, third character here. And uh, I'm going to talk to Pastor Lee about that and ask that question. And this is really kind of the central focus of this whole story. The one who's the very foundation of our faith. We know Jesus kind of, uh, we understand him in, in two perspectives. One, that he is fully God, with all the attributes, fully God. But then the other one, which is probably tougher for us to navigate through, is that He was fully human. I, I think that we can all agree that God, as God, Jesus, I mean, He was capable of anything, right? He had everything necessary to fulfill God's plan, 
including the miracles and transformations and raising the dead, his astounding love for us, his creation. Think about that. And yet, as fully human, not just human, but fully human, to walk in weakness, to walk in frailty that each of us, you and I, can relate to. And Jesus, in that human role, he moved beyond human tendency of comfort and survival and self-preservation, which you and I understand, to surrender himself to the will of the Father. And not just for those 33 years that he walked the earth, but in the most gut-wrenching moment of human history. When he wanted to be freed from that role, and yet he said, but not my will, but yours. Make no mistake, Jesus did not risk his life. He deliberately gave his life for you and for me. So, Lee, considering these qualities of his, his full humanity and yet his limitless power as Jehovah, he could have found, as God, he could have found another way out. So my question to you is, how could he take on the full brunt of the punishment and death due to you and me, to the sins of all mankind? How could he place himself in that situation and follow through in obedience? How could he? Well, you know, from... A human standpoint, like even as, as people and as we look at it, I have no idea how he could do that. Like if I put myself in that place, the answer is no. Like I could not have done that. Like that is impossible. So on one hand, it's an impossible question to answer of like how could he in his humanity, not the divinity part, you can kind of go, well, because he was God. But in his humanity, how could he bear that? How could he, and I think, you know, you see the torment of that question even in the garden of sweating like drops of blood, like take this, like there, this, my humanity side, this is impossible, but it's not my will, it's yours. And I think as you've already said in, in kind of prepping the question, it is in full surrender that he was able. It was in that full obedience and surrender to God that he was actually able to do that because he was fully God but he was also fully human and the human side would have needed all of the father's strength to go and be obedient all the way to the cross you know you look at Jesus he was obedient to the father his entire life everything that's recorded about Jesus he was obedient and it says it over and over it's all over in the gospels in the story of Christ in both his you know in not so much his birth because there's nothing you can be obedient when you're a little baby other than you know listen to your mom but you know, he's a, he's a boy at the temple, and he's, you know, teach, he's teaching these rabbis, these teachers of the law, and they're all astounded with this stuff that he's saying. And his parents are like, what are you doing here? He's like, well, I'm doing the will of my father, right? Like that. So right from an even early age, he's doing the will of the father. But then you see it all throughout the history. He's always like, it's not, it's not my words, it's the father's words. It's not my actions, it's the father's actions. I'm, he was constantly referring back to, I do the father's will, and that is what I'm called to do. You know, you look at John 14, 31, um, and it says, um, well, it's shiny, so I have to now look. Uh, but the world must learn that I love the Father, and I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. All throughout the Scripture, we see these words. I do what the Father says. And the Father was leading him to the cross. In Philippians 2, 7 to 8, it said, Rather, he made himself nothing, by taking on the very nature of a servant. And Pastor Don, you already talked about that servant heart that Jesus had. So he took on the likeness and the nature of the ser servant, being made hum in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, surrendered himself, by becoming obedient to death, even to death on a cross. And so in his surrender, in his obedience, becoming a servant, that's how he ended up at the cross. But when I started to really dig into what does obedience look like? What does 
um, following the will of the Father look like? What does it look like to obey the Father? You only have to look into verse 15 in John then to start to figure out, well, what is the will of God? And the will of God is to love. When you read 15, 9 to 13, it says this, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you that my joy may be complete in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. So this is Jesus' command, which just mirrors the Father's command. Remember, he said, I have followed the Father and remained in his love. Now do as I do so that you can remain in me and in the Father. So this is his command, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then points to the cross. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So we see this obedience to the Father's will is ultimately about this transformation of not so much that it's love as far as a feeling. You know, and we t- you already talked about, Pastor Rick, the 1 Corinthians 13, and talking about, like, what is love? Love is a transformation of not being in that human nature, that sin nature, the, the Judas that's inside of all of us, the Peter, the denier that's inside all of us, but rather to be transformed into his likeness, which is to be transformed into love that love is patient and it's kind and it's gentle. And so as we are transformed in this love, when we start to see that, that love is not just an action, love is character. And so when we read in Romans 5.8, it says God demonstrates his own love for us. He demonstrates his character for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were Judas, while we were Peter, while we were thieves on a cross, he died for us. So in the midst of our broken humanity, and even though he was fully human, he was still fully God, understanding that the will of God is to see us restored back into a relationship all the way back when we look at where Adam was and Adam and Eve, and he had this perfect relationship with them, and then it broke because of sin and brokenness. And we see that in Peter, and we see that in Judas. And this was the opportunity to restore God's will back is being in that restored relationship of love between him and his creation, him and his people, the people that he's created. And so then when you start going to love one another as I've loved you, then that's the call for all of us then as followers of Jesus is to love as he's loved, which is to live sacrificially, to live fully surrendered to the will of God, which is to be fully surrendered to the transformation that he offers to us. And so how could he? I have no idea. And at the same time, it seems, for as I read through the scripture and as we pound in, he did it in full surrender, in full obedience, and with full love. That's how. Yeah, it's interesting. We, as you say, we can relate to the other characters, but you're right. I I don't know how, I don't think we can relate. We cannot fathom what is that Jesus did or we would be him. And, and what it leaves me with is, how, 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 do I, how do I finish off with that, with Jesus? How, what's my response to that? And when I think about it, because I can't fathom, I can't really relate other than to shake my head with profound thankfulness that he did what none of us could do. That was the whole reason why he did what he did, because none of us could do it. So the profound thankfulness. Well, we move now to really the kind of the application of this, and, and Guna, um, this is a kind of a tricky one because it, it, addresses, it addresses all of us that are sitting up here. It addresses our tech team sitting up there and everybody who is watching this morning. Uh, we're reminded that all through Scripture, we see that, fi- that fickle nature of our human condition. And we see it right from Adam and Eve in the garden who had full fellowship with God in the image of God, walking with God, and then they chose independence from God. They were tempted to it, and they said, you could be like God but without God, and they went for it. So we see it right from them all the way down to those who were in that crowd laying palm branches, uh, you know, uh, one week and saying, Hosanna, and just a few days later, yelling, crucify him. This is our human condition, our our natural 
human tendency is we love to obey the rules. We, we love to have something, well, if, I, if, if you give me rules and I do that, then I'm good to go. And yet, we fall short, both in the ancient times and right now, we fall short and we keep on grasping for ways to make amends in our thoughts, in our actions, in our words. I love that Scripture records weakness and failure and compromise and the sins of even our, our heroes of faith in the Hebrews. And these, these heroes, yes, but they were weak people, just the same as we are. So, Guna, considering this disturbing reflection of our own hopelessness and ineptitude as humans, our natural tendencies... I guess my question is, how can we possibly grasp, accept, and be transformed by what Jesus did for us, for me, for you? How how can we? How do we proceed from here? Thank you, Pastor Dell. (laughs) Yeah, today's focus is on Peter and Judas, and knowing what they are. And if I were to be a CEO, CEO of a company, would I join such people into my company, into my team? <laughs> no. My no would be a real, real embossed no. I would say no, not now, not ever. <laughs> That's where I'm coming from today, yes. While this question is posed, yeah, I've been thinking about it, praying about it, and asking God, seeking God to give me the wisdom to, yeah, I know, there's so many people out there watching us, and yes, may this word be a blessing to you all this Good Friday. Now, before we go anywhere, let me establish a fact here. Jesus himself chose all the three people. There is no doubt about it. It is said in one of my readings I read that somewhere in between his ministry, maybe 18 months or something into his ministry, he had several uh, disciples. He chose the 12. And that's reflected in Mark chapter 3, 13 to 19. And it says here, Jesus went up on the mountain and summoned more, uh, summoned those whom he himself wanted. And they came to him, and he appointed the twelve. He appointed them. Then not only that, he did not stop there, like some of you have mentioned. He gave them authority. He gave them power to heal, to preach, to raise the dead, to uh, cast out demons, the devil, things like that, to deliver people. He gave them authority. And all of these twelve, including Peter and Judas, were involved. So, on first-hand basis, they saw what this man had brought into this world. Well, uh, let me quote a few scriptures to, you know, sort of uh, add more weight to what I've been saying. It says here in Luke 6, the Apostle Luke, or the Gospel writer Luke says in 6.12, Now it was during this time that Jesus went out to the mountain to pray. And he prayed the whole night. Ask me to pray for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It is tough. And this guy goes up and he prays whole night. And then he comes down and he picks 12. Who are. To any guy who has been in authority, these guys do not fit the bill. (laughs) These guys do not fit the bill, yeah. And then John writes in 225. He did not need anyone to testify about men. That means Jesus knew every individual. He knew everyone, for he knew what was in man. Totally. And then John 6, 70 says, and Jesus replied, he's making an answer, and he's saying, did I not choose you all, the twelve, and yet one of you is The devil. That is a strong word, I guess. But in those days, they used to use that. You are the devil, he says. And then, this was quoted 
by I think um, our pastor Lee, uh, Lee. John 13, 10 to 13, uh, no, I think uh, Dell did this, yes, from Psalm. It's actually, Jesus replied and he said, The one who has bathed needs no, only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not every one of you. John 13, 11. For Jesus knew the one who was going to betray him. For this reason, he said, not every one of you is clean. Now, coming back to the question, what would I do? How would I handle this? And like I said, I have no clue. But then, I have two options here. And this is from the scripture. I can either lean towards the scripture, or I can lean into myself. It could be me. You know, when I am... Working through my body, I am depending on my doctorate, I am depending on my experience, I am depending on my reasoning, I am depending on my emotions. That is me, all the way me. And if, if it is me, I would say no to Peter, no to Judas. But on the contrary, if I were to lean on the spirit, my answer would be different. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 5, 17, and he says, For the flesh, that is the body, the flesh, sets its desire against the spirit. And the spirit always sets itself against the flesh. For they are in opposition. They are in opposition to one another. Why? Why are they in opposition to one another? So that you may do the right thing. So we may do the right thing. This shows that we are either living in the flesh or we are living according to the spirit. But unfortunately, to tell all the dignitaries and the wise men on the stage today, we always, always lean towards, I know, you know what. <laughs> you lean towards your body, into yourself, into your experiences, into your, you know, so-called education. That's good. Education is good. I'm not against it. But then, you know, there is something here that I would like to bring up at this point of time. I would like to tell you a small story, a parable in the language of the Bible. And I call this parable the parable of the crabs, you know, the creepy crawly things, the crabs that uh, crawl, walk sideways, Crabs in a bucket. It says here, one time a man was walking along the beach and saw some other person fishing in the surf with a bucket beside him. As he drew closer, he saw that the bucket had no lid. He was fishing for crabs and he had a bucket by his side, but the bucket did not have a lid on it. So curious to know, he said, sir, why don't you cover your bucket so the crabs do not crawl out? And here's the answer. You do not understand, young man, the fisherman said. If there were one crab, it would crawl out. I'm, I agree. But when there are several crabs in the bucket, however, when there are many crabs in the bucket, if one tries to crawl up the side of the bucket, the other crabs will Pull it down. That is the nature of a crab. It pulls back any crab that is trying to escape. Now, I like to bring a parallel in this and say, like most of the time, me, in my human nature, behave like a crab. I keep pulling down my peers, my youth pastors, <laughs> or whoever is there. I, I pull down my family. I pull down my friends. That is the tendency of human nature because the gospel says again, all we like sheep have turned away and have gone his own way. But God had laid upon him all our sins. And he had to pay the price. And today we are gathered here to celebrate that. So let us say, I am leaning on the flesh the crab, I'm leaning 
on the crab. Can you see this? I am leaning towards the crab and dear Andrew brings Peter to me. What would be my reaction? Like I said, I would tell Andrew, I know you love your brother and he's your brother. But I know beyond that, I know this man is going to betray me. When I need him most, he is going to say, he doesn't know me or he did not know me. And he cannot be predicted. He talks out of his hat. He's totally unpredictable, like in, the story, in your song. How do we pin him down? No, I don't want such a character on my team. I would brush him off. Operating in the flesh, that would have cost our church, the present church, a pioneer preacher, the man on whom the church was established. We would, we would have lost a bold preacher on that first Pentecost Sunday. He stood up in boldness and he spoke and 3,000 men accepted Christ. There and then, I would have cost the church that kind of a man if I was operating like a crab in my flesh. Now, looking at Judas, it's interesting to read that he is the most educated person among all the disciples. And Nathaniel was also educated. And this is Nathaniel who brings him to Jesus and asks him to join in his team. And if I were again walking with the crabs, what would I do? I would say, no way. I would maybe blow my top the way I am, quick to words. I would say, no, I don't want this guy. He is going to betray me. You don't understand, Nathaniel. Get him out of my sight. I don't want him anywhere near me. That would have been my reaction if I were to operate in the crab. But then we see that Jesus operates in the Holy Spirit. He operates, he leans towards the Holy Spirit. And then we see what he says, when Andrew brings Peter to him, he says, he identifies him as the rock on which the church will be built. And he says, you are no longer Simon, you're going to be Cephas, that means rock. Petros, or Peter, rock, you're going to be. He's, the church foundation is going to be on him. Not literally, but he said, this is the guy who's going to start up the church, He'll kick off the church, the early church. Well, and then... We have this Peter, and today we are gathered here together talking and discussing about this Peter and how he, even though you know, in all his weakness and even though the weakness was included in the scripture, we get a lot out of this gentleman. And then we, when we come to Judas, and Nathaniel brings him to Jesus, here again, Jesus is operating in the spirit, unlike me. He is operating in the spirit, and he tells him, okay, not only does he accept him, he gives him charge over his money box. He makes him the fi his financer. And in that, I see the love of the Father to us. Even though many a times we deny, many a times we are betraying him in word, deed, and action. You may not think it's as equal or as bad as what Judas did, but yes, many times we refuse to be identified as Christians out in the marketplace, out on the street, in the binary. We refuse it. What are we doing? We are betraying him. We are denying him. And then he says to Judas, you take up this. And he's actually giving him a chance. Like, you. like Rick said, you know, he had an option. After betraying Jesus, he was destined to betray Jesus, so he betrayed him. Okay, fine. But then, and that's all written and it's uh, prophesied, fine, as long. But after that, he did have a chance. He could have turned around like Peter, but he chose not to, by the way. So, here we see. Now, the interesting part for you guys out there and you guys out here. My question to you all, in all humility and Christian love, 
no ambiguity in that. I'm asking you, are you living according to the flesh, the crab? Are you living according to the spirit? Make an introspection, dear my friends, this Good Friday. Go into yourself. Go into your closet. Talk to yourself and ask yourself, am I operating in flesh when I'm speaking to my wife, my spouse? Am I operating in my flesh when I talk to my children out there? Or when I'm driving out on the streets? Or am I operating in the spirit? Talk to yourself today. Today is the day the Lord has made. And I conclude and say, be not self-centered, be other-centered. Amen. So as we conclude our panel, just to wrap up, and as Guna basically has said that Jesus has called you and me, each one of us, the same as he called Judas and Peter. We are not better, we are the same. He has called us. In fact, He continues to call us. He says, come to me. He says, as many as received Him. Not trying to do this better on our own. The central focus of this story, everything else revolves around it, is Jesus. Faithful is He who has called you. And then it says in Thessalonians, and He will do it. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. It's not on just doing and, and obeying the rules. The central focus is on Jesus and Jesus alone. As we're reminded, that I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Our encouragement to you today as you consider the events of this story is to come in wonder to Jesus, relating to those other parts of this story, these other characters, but to say, Lord Jesus, I need you, the one who has done what I could never do on my own. God bless you as you journey this journey of your mind and your thoughts and these questions, and we'll look forward to uh, joining you in our beautiful town of Summerland to be the church, Jesus Christ the light in darkness. God bless you all. Shall we quieten our spirits for a moment, even as we look to God in prayer? Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry, we may truly and devotely serve you, confirm your universal church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Father God, we pray for one holy Catholic and apostolic church, of Christ throughout the world for its unity in witness and service for all bishops, pastors, evangelists, and other ministers and the people whom they serve. We thank you, Almighty God and Everlasting Father, that by your Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, Kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide. With your wisdom, those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. We pray for all Christians in this community, our country, and the world at large. We pray for those in authority, Elizabeth II, our Queen, our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and for the government and, of, and, for his, and for this country. For the premier of this province, John Hogan, and the members of the legislature. For the mayor of this municipality, Tony Boot, and those who serve with her on the council, and for all who serve the common good, 
that by God's help they may seek justice and live in peace and concord. Father God, we pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, for the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution or prejudice for the sake, the wounded and the handicapped, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and the bereaved, for prisoners and captives, those in mortal danger, that your heavenly Father in your tender mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of your love. Most gracious Father, we pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for all who have not heard the words of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for all those whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and prosecutors or persecutors of his disciples, for all who in the name of Jesus, have persecuted others that you in your infinite mercy would open their hearts to the truth and lead them to the faith and obedience. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly called or recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of his resurrection. Grant them pardon. Bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Above all powers, above all kings, Above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were there before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. Above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind a stone, you live to die, rejected and alone like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall. And thought of me above all. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Just gain I count but loss and poor content on all my pride. See from his head. Rejected and alone like a 
rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all. We want to in- welcome you all to communion and to the Lord's table uh, this morning, or at whatever time you might be joining with us uh, as you watch this wonderful service that we've been having together as the Church of Summerland. And so, uh, Pastor Dale and I, we're going to uh, lead you through this time together and understand that it might look different than what you've maybe experienced in your own personal life or your personal faith or your church family. But we're hoping that you'll understand that together as God's church, that we come together to remember his death, to remember his resurrection on this Good Friday. And so as we, as we can partake of the bread and as we partake of the juice together, we do so as his church together, united in heart and purpose for his, his, uh, for his purpose and his call in our lives. So uh, Dale and I, we were talking about the idea that, that in some ways there's kind of a, a dual focus when it comes to the Lord's table, and that is there's a focus on his death, but there's also this idea and the focus on his resurrection, and so it's not an either or, it's a both end, and so today we want to focus more on the life, the life that we are, that's brought into us or given to us because of the death of Jesus Christ. And I was looking, I was looking, in, uh, studying up on the culture of bread just for a moment, and uh, and so do you know that every single culture has a connection with bread, the essence of bread, the wheat, the grain, whatever kind of grain that they use in their culture, and it's it's known as one of the staples or one of the staples of sustaining life in cultures all around the world. So there's a commonality of this. But there's another piece of, of the bread that I, I always like to emphasize, and that is all the different kernels of wheat, say if it's whole wheat flour, um, give their life, give of them, them their essence to be able to make this united loaf of bread. And isn't that how it reflects upon the church, that God asks us, each individual, to give of ourselves for the purpose of the church and for the purpose of the call that he, he asks us to give. But it also represents that Jesus is the life, the sustaining source in our lives. As Christ uh, modeled for us what living as the bread of life would look like, he asked us to live as such in the lives of those we meet. That not only is he represented his death in, in, the, in the, Lord's, the Lord's Supper, sorry, but also in the idea of he asks us to bring his life, he's the bread of life, to bring his life into the lives of those that we encounter. But we also see that, that when he's washing the disciples' feet, he says these words, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for, I, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. So though traditionally we focus on the body being sacrificed for us, we also desire to focus on the life-sustaining work in our lives as we serve him together as his church here in Summerland, in the Okanagan, throughout the province, the nation, and all over the world. So as, uh, as Pastor Dale and I, we partake together of this bread, we invite you to do the same and uh, have your bread ready to, to partake together. partake together. Hmm. 
We thank you, Lord. As we move then to the wine or the cup, just to note that the wine represents the blood of Jesus. And many times we think, well, that represents his death. But keep in mind that all through Scripture, Leviticus 17, Deuteronomy 12, the blood is not representative of death but actually of life. The life is in the blood. It is life that is given to and given for us. Now that's the actual wine or the blood, but what about the cup? We hear in Scripture how the cup is noted numerous times in the New Testament, and if you remember how Jesus uses that, the cup, he talks about the cup. In fact, he says, let this cup pass from me when he's in the garden. He refers to Peter, and he says, he's, he says, are you able to drink my cup? Is it an actual cup? Is it a, is it a wine glass? Is it, is it actually something that holds wine? You see, the fact of the matter is the cup in Scripture refers to the context or the current situation in which the life of Christ is revealed. So when Jesus says, take this cup from me, it really doesn't have anything to do with an actual cup. It's this situation that I'm in, take this from me. Our lives are the cup. The context which contains the very life of of Jesus, the lifeblood of Jesus, to be offered and poured out in the midst of our own unique context of life. Now, this may, may be a new concept for you to think of communion in that way, that the cup is the context of your life, which then holds the life of Jesus, that then in our context of life, that we would pour that out. Now, remembrance, which Scripture draws us to, is the first step. But if that remembrance is going to be validated, we need to appropriate or make application of this whole principle. So we remember, and then with a commitment of intention, we put it, that very thing into practice as Christ's life and his sacrifice for you and for me. In communion, the bread and the wine, they are not literally transformed into blood or flesh. But there is an amazing transformation if this is done with the relevance and authenticity of heart, that as we partake with this proper idea that this is the very body of Christ broken and passed out to you and me, that this is His life in the context of our life that is poured out, that then you and I are transformed. So it's not, it's not this juice, this bread that's transformed. It's you and I. It's Pastor Don and myself that are transformed into the hands and the feet of Jesus. We are not Jesus but by His indwelling presence, because of His resurrection life, we are transformed into His hands and His feet. This is the relevance of the bread and the cup. Jesus said that this is the new covenant in my blood, the new covenant that you would love one another the way that I have loved you. How has He loved us? He gave Himself up for us. And it is with that attitude of heart that we then partake and we drink of the cup in the context of your and my life, the life, the lifeblood of Jesus, that then we would be transformed into his hands and his feet for his honor and his glory. Would you join and partake with us? Lord Jesus, may you be seen and evident in our lives this day 
and in the days to come. Amen. Well, Summerland Churches, thank you for joining us today. Uh, It was an absolute privilege uh, to minister together uh, as a team. And really, that's what we recognize as a ministerial, is that we're in this together. And uh, the church is bigger than just a single church. We know that there's the big C church as we follow Jesus and move forward together. I want to leave you with a benediction today as we close our service. It says, sisters and brothers, since we stand surrounded by those who have all gone before, an enormous cloud of witnesses, let us drop every extra weight, every sin that clings to us and slackens our pace, and let us run with endurance the long race that's set before us. Stay focused on Jesus, who designed and perfected our faith. He endured the cross. He ignored the shame of that death because he focused on the joy that was set before him. And now he is seated beside God on the throne, a place of honor. In the same way, let us focus on the race ahead, going into the days of this week, strong and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and confident that God goes with us. Amen.